ever feel like life is just not fair? Maybe that you're going through a time of suffering and you ask yourself, what did I do to bring on this suffering? And maybe you can say to yourself, I don't think I've done anything to bring on this suffering. I feel like I've lived a good life. I feel like I'm living for the Lord. I'm obeying his word, and yet I'm still facing suffering. Do you just ask yourself sometimes, God, where are you? You're going through a trial. You're trying to be faithful to the Lord, and yet you know that God is with you, and yet still you ask yourself, God, why haven't you intervened? Why haven't you ended this trial? Why are you allowing me, your child, your servant, to go through so much suffering and pain, and I feel like I haven't done anything to bring it on myself? You know, when you read through the Bible, what you'll find is many of God's premier servants suffered. Joseph suffered. Jeremiah suffered. Job suffered. And, of course, Jesus himself suffered and they didn't do anything to bring that suffering on they suffered because they were faithful to God you know many years ago I was a young believer and I read a book entitled how to handle adversity and it's written by Dr. Charles Stanley if you've never read the book I would encourage you to read it how to handle adversity by Charles Stanley and in that book at the beginning of the book he said there are three sources of adversity. He said sometimes the source is God himself. Sometimes God brings trials into our lives. Sometimes God is disciplining us and helping us to grow through the trials and hardships that we face. He said a second source of adversity, and he said the most common source, in his opinion, it's our own doing. We make bad choices we sin, we don't go the right route, and we bring so much suffering on ourselves. And then he said a third source, he would say, would be Satan, that sometimes Satan attacks us and Satan brings adversity on us. So sometimes God is the source, many times it's our own doing, and then third, sometimes it's Satan. Now, I would add a fourth source, and he maybe kind of talks about this under our own doing, but I think sometimes it's just that we live in a fallen world. You know, this is not the perfect world that God originally created. We fail. We turn from God. And because of that, there's disease and sickness and death and suffering. And sometimes the source is just we live in an imperfect, fallen world. Well, I want to look at a story in the Bible today about a man that I believe that the source of his adversity was Satan. It was an attack of the evil one because of his faithfulness to God. And whether you've read the Bible a lot or not, there are people who have never opened the Bible, and yet they've heard of the story of Daniel and the lion's den. You see, we've been in this series called More Than a Story, and this is the last sermon in that series and what I mean by more than a story, this really happened. Even last night, one of the children during our devotional time, they asked me, are these stories in the Bible really true? Did those stories really happen? Yes, they did. It's more than a story. I believe this really happened. And we're also calling this more than a story because I want you to know these are more than stories that you learned in Sunday school. These are more than just stories that help children. These are for adults. These are for believers, not just new believers, seasoned believers. This is more than a story. And so if you have your Bible, I want you to take it today and turn over to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, and I want to read the entire chapter as we think today about Daniel and the lion's den and how do we understand suffering? How do we process suffering? Again, maybe you're going through a season of suffering and you don't think you've done anything to bring it on yourself. How do you process that? Well, let's look. Daniel chapter 6 beginning with verse 1. 
Darius decided to appoint 120 satraps, these were basically local rulers, over the kingdom, stationed throughout the realm, and over them, three administrators, including Daniel. So Daniel was among the top three. These satraps would be accountable to them so that the king would not be defrauded. He wanted his money from the taxes and the revenues. Daniel distinguished himself above the administrators and satraps because he had an extraordinary spirit. So the king planned to set him over the whole realm. So he would rise above the other two administrators and he would be the top dog. Verse 4, the administrators and satraps therefore kept trying to find a charge against Daniel regarding the kingdom. But they could find no charge or corruption, for he was trustworthy, and no negligence or corruption was found in him. Then these men said, We will never find any charge against this Daniel unless we find something against him concerning the law of his God. Not thinking he would break the law, but knowing Daniel would keep God's law no matter what. Verse 6, so the administrators and satraps went, to get, went together to the king and said to him, May King Darius live forever. All the administrators of the kingdom, the prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an edict that for 30 days anyone who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den. Therefore, your majesty, establish the edict and sign the document so that, as a law of the Medes and Persians, it is irrevocable and cannot be changed. So King Darius signed the written edict. See, they had ulterior motives. But he thought, oh, they want to honor me. And yet they really wanted to destroy Daniel. Verse 10, when Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went into his house. The windows in its upstairs room opened toward Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel petitioning and imploring his God. So they approached the king and asked about his edict. Didn't you sign an edict that for 30 days any person who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, as a law of the Medes and Persians, the order stands and is irrevocable. Then they replied to the king, Daniel, one of the Judean exiles, there they're trying to put him down, by the way, has ignored you, the king, and the edict you signed, for he prays three times a day. As soon as the king heard this, he was very displeased. He set his mind on rescuing Daniel and made every effort until sundown to deliver him. Then these men went together to the king and said to him, You know, your majesty, that is the law of the Medes and Persians that no edict or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. Stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring, and with the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing in regard to Daniel could be changed. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and he could not sleep, which means he didn't eat, he didn't sleep, and he didn't watch any television. Verse 19. At the first light of the dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel, Daniel, and I love how he refers to him, 
Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, has your God, and here it is again, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke with the king, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they haven't harmed me, for I was found innocent before him. And also before you, your majesty, I have not done harm. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was brought up from the den, he was found to be unharmed, for he trusted in his God. The king then gave the command, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den. They, their children, and their wives, they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to those of every people, nation, and language who live on the whole earth, may your prosperity abound. I issue a decree that in all my royal dominion, people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He rescues and delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth, for he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Daniel suffered. Daniel faced hostility. What was the cause? What was the source of the adversity that Daniel faced? I don't believe it was God himself that sent this upon Daniel. I don't believe it was the result of his own doing, for he was a trustworthy man. He was a faithful man. I believe this was a satanic attack. It was a satanic attack brought against Daniel. You see, Daniel suffered not because of his iniquity, but because of his integrity. Not because of his iniquity, not because he had sinned, not because he had done wrong, not because he lacked faithfulness to God. You see, Daniel suffered not because of his iniquity, but because of his integrity. You see, King Darius, he spotted Daniel. He saw in Daniel a faithful man. He was a man of principle. He was a man of integrity. There was no corruption found in him. There was no negligence found in him. And he made him one of the three top administrators over the kingdom, the Persian kingdom. And then he said, I'm actually going to make him the top one over the rest, over the other administrators, and over all the satraps, the prefects, the governors, over everything, Daniel will have the oversight. And let me tell you, these administrators didn't like that. These satraps didn't like that. Do you know that in your job and in your workplace, not everyone's going to celebrate your success? Not everybody's going to be happy when you get a raise. Not everybody's going to celebrate when you get a promotion. Some people are going to be jealous. Some people are going to envy your success. You know also in the job that not everybody wants to work with a person of integrity. Some people... They want to work with a person who doesn't have principles and doesn't have integrity. Why? Because your integrity reveals their lack of integrity. They want to cut corners. They want to cheat. They want to do things that are dishonest. 
But if you're their boss or even you're their co-worker, you will spot that. You will not approve of that. Not everyone is going to celebrate your success. Not everybody wants to work with someone of integrity. And the same was true with these administrators and these satraps. And therefore, they had a plot. They had a plan. We're going to bring Daniel down. And they looked. They looked for a cause to be able to criticize him. And they kept looking, and they kept looking, and they could find no wrong in Daniel. And so they said, the only way we're going to bring him down is by doing something that would cause him to have to choose between the law of his God and what King Darius would would put, put forth as an edict. And so they manipulated the king. They went into the king, and they said, hey, We've got a brilliant idea. We don't want anyone to pray except to you, king, for 30 days. He wasn't saying this was, would be forever, but for 30 days, if anyone prays, if anyone petitions their God, it has to be to King Darius. He was flattered by this. He didn't know that they were trying to bring Daniel down, and so he said, sure, I'll sign the edict. And it went into place. And what did Daniel do? He went as was his custom. And with the windows open, he prayed to God. And therefore, they accused him before the king. You see, Daniel suffered not because of his iniquity, but because of his integrity. Do you know not everyone has integrity? Not everyone that you work with has integrity. Did you hear about the man who was dishonest about his income tax return and he began to feel guilty about it? So he sent an anonymous letter to the IRS and put some cash in it. The letter said, I lied on my tax return and I feel really bad about it and I haven't been able to sleep because of it. Enclosed is $150, $150 in cash. If I still can't sleep, I'll send the rest. (laughs) Some people just don't have integrity. And they're cutting the corners and they're lying and they're cheating. Not Daniel. Daniel was a man of God. Let me remind you of Psalm 34, verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, delivers him out of them all. The righteous. It doesn't say many are the afflictions of the unrighteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And unfortunately, I have to say to you, it says many, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But I'm also glad it has that second part to the verse. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now, I will say to you, some people bring suffering on themselves. And I think I tend to agree with Dr. Charles Stanley that most of the suffering that people go through, they bring on themselves. But there are times when maybe it's sent by the Lord and times when it's sent by the evil one. And there are times when you are faithful to God and you're true to God and you're not suffering because you did anything wrong but you're suffering because you did everything right. There's a difference between persecution and punishment. Persecution is when you suffer for doing right. Punishment is when you suffer for doing wrong. And you and I both know that there are people at times that they think they're being persecuted when they're really being punished. I think about children. I think about teenagers. And you know, moms and dads, if they're good moms and dads, there's going to be some rules in your home. There's going to be some curfews in your home. There's going to be some order in your home. And certain things you can do and certain things you can't do, and they just don't hand you the remote control and say, watch whatever you want all day long. They don't give you a big old bag of chips and say, this is all you have to eat today. There are rules and there are order curfews, 
discipline. And yet that daughter or that son can say, oh, I'm being persecuted again. Mom's persecuting me. Dad's persecuting me. Hey, if you make bad choices and you do wrong and you lie, cheat, you dishonor mom and dad and they discipline you and there are consequences, that's not persecution. That is punishment and that's because they love you. Any parent can just say, do whatever you want. Any parent can just have their own life and let the kids just be raised by the television and let the kids be raised by the neighborhood parents and have no consequences and no discipline. Any parent can do that. I tell you what, being a dad is more than having a lady get pregnant and you being responsible for it. Being a dad is you're involved in the person's life. Being a dad is that you are involved in the son's life. You are involved in the daughter's life. And you care enough to correct and discipline. And that's not, pun that's not persecution, my friend. That's punishment. That's discipline. And it's for your own good. And so when you think about Daniel, he didn't suffer because of his iniquity. He suffered because of his integrity. He was faithful to God. He was true to God, and he stood true and faithful through the trial and through the suffering. How was he able to do that? How was David able to hear that edict, knowing that he could throw his whole political career in the trash, knowing that it would cost him his life? How could a man like that stand true? Daniel remained faithful because he was a man of prayer. If you know anything about Daniel, if you ever read the book of Daniel, this man was a man of prayer. It says he prayed three times a day, which probably meant morning, afternoon, and evening. He was a man who was faithful to God. Why? Because he was a man of prayer. And when the edict came forth, and I'll read you the passage again. Look at verse 10. It says, when Daniel learned that the document had been signed, when he heard about the edict, when he knew the consequences, he went into his house. The windows in the upstairs room opened toward Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to his God just as he had done before. Nothing changed. Why? Because he was a man of prayer. Now, you know what Daniel could have done? If you read the petition, or if you read the edict carefully, it doesn't say that you have to pray to King Darius. It doesn't say that. It says if anyone prays or petitions any god, it has to be to King Darius. It doesn't say you have to pray to him doesn't say you have to pray at all. It just says you can't pray to any other God. So Daniel could have said, well, I'm just going to take some time off from my prayer life. I'll just take a 30-day vacation from the Lord. God knows I really love him. But I'm going to just take some time off from prayer. Or he could have said, I'm just going to pray in my mind. I'm not going to voice my prayer. I'm not going to pray ever in public. I'm going to shut that window. I'm going to close the blinds. And if anyone's ever around, I'm just going to silently pray in my mind. It's just for 30 days. Could he not have done that? I remember a lady once telling me, she said, my walk with God or my relationship with God, my religion, I'm not sure how she phrased it, but she said, my relationship with God is private. Private. I want to tell you something. It's not private. Your relationship with God is personal, but it's not private. And don't confuse those two terms. It's personal. You should have a personal relationship with God. You should have a relationship with God that's meaningful 
It's not your spouse's relationship with God. It's not your parents' relationship with God. It's not your pastor's relationship with God. It's a personal relationship with God, but it's not private. And Daniel's relationship with God was not private. He went and he prayed, and notice how he prayed. Daniel prayed openly, daily, humbly, and gratefully. And that's how we should pray. Notice he prayed openly. He prayed openly for, before God. It says the windows were open. He didn't shut the blinds. Let me ask you, when you go as a family to a restaurant and you sit down at Cracker Barrel, you sit down at Texas Roadhouse, or you sit down wherever it is, Wendy's, do you take time as a family and bow your heads and have a word of prayer to bless your meal? Or do you say, oh, we just do that when we're at home, but, you know, we're at, when we're at a restaurant, we're, we don't want to stand out or we don't want to offend anybody. I don't know about you, but when I'm at a restaurant and I see a family come in and they all bow their heads and they say a prayer, I just want to go up to them and say, praise the Lord. Are you a brother in Christ? Are you a sister in Christ? We should pray openly. We should not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. And I think about the schools. I don't know if they still do it, but they used to do that, meet at the flagpole and pray together before school. That's a way a, a kid can, can publicly say, I'm a Christian. I'm not saying you have to do this, and I don't even know if you would with our smartphones and iPads, but my senior year of high school, I had become a Christian, and I decided to take my Bible to school each day. And I took my Bible right along with my textbooks, and I would read my Bible when I had opportunities. And I had a few people make fun of me. And I had a few people point at that book and say, why are you carrying a Bible around? Are you a Bible thumper? Are you this? Are you that? But I wanted my faith to be open. I even did a couple of things. And sometimes I wonder, how was I so bold? I was just a teenager. But I remember in high school a couple of times I asked my teacher, can I make an announcement at the end of class? And she said, yes. And I stood up before my class, and I told them where I went to church, and I wanted to invite all of my classmates to church to worship with me that Sunday. I don't know how I was that bold just being 17, 18 years of age, but I want to tell you there's a fire in my heart and a boldness from God, and I wasn't ashamed of my faith. Are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? Daniel prayed openly. He also prayed daily. He said he prayed three times a day. Now, I don't think we should be legalistic with this. I'm not saying you've got to pray morning, afternoon, and evening. I'll go a step further. It says pray without ceasing. So just pray all day. It doesn't mean you always have to be on your knees and you always have to be, you know, praying in a way that's vocalized, but it does mean that you are regularly in prayer and you have a spirit of prayer, an attitude of prayer, mentality of prayer. Daniel was a man of prayer. Daniel would have never stood the test if he was not a man of prayer. And I just want to warn you today, don't think, well, I'll become a man of prayer when I go through the trial. I'll become a woman of prayer. I'll really get close to God whenever I go through the trial. You better become a man of prayer right now. You better become a woman of prayer right now because if you're not, you won't stand the trial. He prayed daily. He also prayed humbly. He got down on his knees. Again, I'm not saying you have to pray on your knees every time you pray, but he got down on his knees. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do you know if you exalt yourself... God will humble you, and if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. And I also tell you this, you're going to be humbled. Either you humble yourself or God will humble you. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather humble myself than let God humble me. You humble yourself, God will exalt you. You try to exalt yourself, let me tell you, God knows how to put you down. God knows how to put you in your place. 
and God knows how to remind you of how small and insignificant you are, why not do it yourself? And if you do it yourself, it honors God, and he exalts you. And then he also prayed gratefully. It said he thanked the Lord. Now, think about that. You know if you pray, you're going to the lion's den. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not afraid to die, but there are certain ways I don't want to die. You know what I'm talking about? I don't want to die in the mouth of a great white shark. I, that's not the way I want to go. Now, I know I'd just go right out of that mouth or the belly into the presence of the Lord. I don't want to go that way. I don't want to be burned up in a house fire. There's a lot of ways I don't want to go. And I certainly don't want to be eaten by lions. I've seen what they do to animals. I have the Discovery Channel, and I have Animal Planet. They start eating them before they're dead. I don't want that. Daniel knew that was in the picture. His prayer, it says, he still thanked God. It reminds me of Jesus. It says, on the night he was betrayed, he thanked God. Now, it's one thing to thank God when things are smooth and thank God when there aren't trials and to thank God when it's blessing after blessing after blessing. It's another to thank God when you know that your life can be forfeit because of your faithfulness to God. Daniel prayed openly, daily, humbly, and gratefully. Daniel was a man of prayer. And that's why God delivered. Remember the verse, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. You see, when you think about Daniel's deliverance, and don't miss this, Daniel was delivered not from his trial, but in it. You see, we want to be delivered from the trial. Daniel was not delivered from the trial. He was delivered in the trial. He still was falsely accused. He still was arrested. He still was placed in the lion's den. And the only thing that didn't happen, they didn't eat him. God delivered him. God didn't deliver him from the trial. God delivered him in the trial. Psalm 91, verses 14 and 15. Because he has set his heart on me, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls out to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and give him honor. And, and trouble here isn't talking about you've done something wrong and you're in trouble. It's trouble like a trial or a hardship. I will be with him in trouble, in hardship, in adversity, and I will deliver him. Daniel was not delivered from the trial. He was delivered in the trial. It was a miracle. Don't think, well, these lions were just lazy and they had been fed the night before. How do we know? Because the next morning when King Darius spoke to Daniel, Daniel said, God sent his angel, and he closed their mouths. And if you still don't believe that, King Darius was so angry. He loved Daniel. He was going to make him top dog. He loved Daniel, and he knew he had been manipulated. Don't you feel like a fool when you've been manipulated? He knew he had been manipulated. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw you in the den. I'm going to throw your wives in the den. I'm going to throw your children in the den. That was cruel. But that's what King Darius did. It says before they even got to the bottom of the den, the lions came up, overpowered them, and crushed their bones. Let me tell you, they were hungry lions. These lion dens, they knew what they were doing. They knew if somebody was going to be punished that you know, they would make sure they were hungry and ferocious. Daniel was not eaten. It wasn't because the lions weren't hungry and they were old and lazy and this and that. No, ferocious lions, hungry lions, bone-crushing lions. But God sent his angel and shut the mouth 
of the lions. You know, I wonder what he did that night. We don't know. But, you know, you kind of use your sanctified imagination. I mean, I'm telling you what, if I knew the angel was there and they couldn't harm me, man, I would get as close to those lions as possible. I mean, they're majestic beings. Did he use one as a pillow? Did he prop his legs up on the other one? I mean, we don't know. Don't send me a letter or tell me I'm reading something into the text. I'm just saying we don't know what he did. But he wasn't afraid. The king never slept a wink. I bet Daniel got some good rest. I bet Daniel slept. Why? Because he knew the Lord was with him. And the Lord's angel shut the lion's mouth. They couldn't harm him. I'll tell you what, no matter what the trial is or the source of the trial, God is sovereign over the trial. Even with Job, God would say to him, now you can do this, but you can't do that. You can go this far, but no farther. God is sovereign over the trial. And God said, well, you can put him in the lion's den, but they're not going to eat him because I'm in control. Aren't you glad you serve a powerful God? I don't want to serve a a God that's not all powerful. I don't want to serve a God that doesn't love me and can't help me in the severest trial that I face in life. I want a God that's sovereign over humanity, sovereign over creation, sovereign over the wild beast, sovereign over the majestic beings in the ocean. I want a God that is the creator of all and rules over all and is the most powerful being in the universe. That's God. And because of Daniel's faithfulness, he was promoted. Think about how King Darius spoke of God, the God of Daniel. Now, that's a great title, isn't it? The God of Daniel, because he knew that was Daniel's God. And even, even the king said to the people, and I'll read it again, verses 25 through 27. Then King Darius wrote to those of every people, nation, and language who live on the whole earth, May your prosperity abound. I issue a decree. Now, this is a good decree. The other one was not good. Nobody pray but to me for 30 days. This is a good decree. He says that in all my royal dominion, people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever, and his kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He rescues and delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth, for he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. You know, our greatest witness may be how we handle adversity. That may be your greatest witness. How do you handle adversity as a believer? Many years ago, who also served as an associate pastor, and his name was Henry Howard. And those of you who knew him, you know what a man of God he was, and he was a man of prayer too, like Daniel. He visited people, prayed with people at the altars, preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, When I came here to be the associate pastor in 1995, he was attending the congregation. And I was able to worship with him, go into his home at different times and sit down with him and Darlene and hear stories about Old Grand Avenue and he would just give advice and always an encourager. Always saying, I'm praying for you, Brother Mark. I'm praying for Brother Curtis. And just loved Henry Howard, knew him well. Well, as he got older and he went into the hospital, his mind began to fade. And he couldn't remember what he once remembered. And I went into the hospital on one occasion to visit him, and I could tell he didn't know who I was. And I hadn't been talking to him very long until he said, Young man, are you saved? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And I said, oh, I do, Brother Howard. I'm a Christian. He said, oh, praise the Lord. I'm so glad to hear that. Here is a man that did not know who I was, probably did not know the name of the hospital he was in, 
I don't even know if he knew his own name at that time. And yet, what was still in his heart? Jesus. Evangelism. Sharing the gospel. I mean, you just think about that. All of that had left. And what was still there, and what impressed me so much when I left that hospital room, all of that left. And yet, he said, young man, are you saved? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? The trials, the trials that you go through, they reveal what's really in you. Jesus was in him. And you could take his memory, and you could take his health, and you could take his diet. You were not getting Jesus out of Henry Howard. It was too deeply rooted. I want to ask you, when you go through the adversity, when you go through the trial, do you know that may be your greatest witness? How you handle adversity? And if Christ is in you, he's going to remain in you through that adversity. And actually, he's going to shine through that time. Are you like Daniel? Are you a man of prayer? Are you a woman of prayer? Are you going through a season of adversity, suffering? You feel like life's not fair? Why did you allow this to happen? Why did my spouse walk out on me? Why did my loved one die? Why did I lose my job? Why did she get the promotion rather than myself? Are you going through suffering? No, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, he delivers them out of them all. He's not going to rescue you from the trial always, but he will rescue you in the trial. Thank you for joining us today for Town Church Online. We pray you've been blessed, encouraged, and even challenged by today's message. If you would like to respond in any way, maybe you'd like to give your heart to Jesus. Maybe you have a prayer request you'd like to share, or you'd like to just check in and let us know how you're doing. You can go to our website at town.church connect and fill out our online connect card there. Also, if you'd like to give to Town Church to support the continuing ministry here in our area and beyond, go to our website at town.church slash invest and you can give of your tithes and offerings there. Make sure to like, subscribe, or to follow uh, so you can get these messages each time they come on. You can find the, the links there in the description of this video. Until we're able to see each other again, we pray you be blessed.